Let's look at the posterior triangle. This is the outline of our lecture. We have to be able to define the posterior triangle, the location of the triangle, the boundaries and its subdivisions, the content of the posterior triangle and some clinical applications. The posterior triangle is a triangular space that is located around the lateral side of the neck. We have the right posterior triangle and the left posterior triangle. Before we deeply go into the posterior triangle, to give an in-depth understanding, we would like to draw a four-sided boundaries around the lateral side of the neck. And these boundaries will follow this pattern. We have the superior boundary that is like an imaginary line that is drawn from the angle of mandible to the mastoid process of the temporal bone. So you have an imaginary line drawn superiorly between these two structures. And you have the inferior imaginary line drawn along the upper border of the clavicle. Then we have an imaginary vertical line that is drawn around the anterior midline plane of the neck. Then finally, to form the four-sided outline, we have the posterior boundary drawn vertically along the anterior margin of the trapezius at the back. So you have this four-sided presentation around the lateral side of the neck, and this can be well visualized when the neck is tilted to one side. So let's take it from here and see where the posterior triangle is specifically placed within this configuration. So having drawn a four-sided quadrilateral presentation, we have the anterior heart line, we have the superior heart line, we have the inferior heart line and the posterior heart line. So this four-sided presentation is further divided along its diagonal by the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So we have the sternocleidomastoid muscle around this space, dividing this four-sided presentation into two triangular spaces. So we have a triangular space at the front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and we have another triangular space behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So the triangular space anterior to the sternocleidomastoid is termed the anterior triangle, while the one posterior or located behind the sternocleidomastoid is termed the posterior triangle. And this is the anterior triangle, and we have the posterior triangle just behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And this is going to be the focus of our lecture for today. In subsequent lecture, we would be looking at the anterior triangle so the two muscles that are involved in the formation of the posterior triangle are the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle. Let's take a look at these two muscles individually to see where they originate from and where they are inserted upon. The sternocleidomastoid muscle originates from, from two points. We have the first point being the manubrum of the sternum. This is the sternal bone, the breast bone on the anterior midline plane in the thorax. And this is the upper part that is termed the manubrum. And this is one of the origination sites of the sternocleidomastoid. Why the second limb originate from the medial thought of the clavicle? So they have two origination points. So this muscle then ascends upward and they get inserted onto the mastoid process of the temporal bone. And that is where the formation of the name is being drafted from. They have the sternum, they have the cladal, which is the clavicle, then they have the mastoid. So they have the sternocleidomastoid muscle. That's the sternocleidomastoid. Then the second muscle of interest in the formation of the posterior triangle is the trapezius muscle. The trapezius muscle is a large triangular paired muscle that originates from the occipital bone upward. They run through the cervical and the thoracic vertebra. And finally, they run lateral words, become inserted onto the spine of the scapula. The spine of the scapula is a protrusion that separates the infrascapular fossa from the suprascapular fossa. 
So this is the spine and this is the point where they are inserted upon. This is just one of the muscles. We have one on the right and the other on the left. So if you take the two muscles together, it's going to form a diamond shaped muscle. When one side of the muscle is taken into consideration, then it is a triangular shaped muscle. So it depends on how we want to view it. So this is another muscle of interest in the formation of the posterior triangle. And you can see the way they run. We're presented on this image. You can see where they run on the lateral side, giving a posterior limit to the space around the lateral region of the neck. So the boundaries of the posterior triangle. So what would not be the boundaries of this triangle? The boundaries can be presented with this image because it's a triangular space, definitely it will be having three boundaries. Of course, there's going to be an apex. So let's see how the boundaries are being projected. We have the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the front. We have the trapezius behind. Then inferiorly, we have the clavicle. So the anterior border of the posterior triangle would be formed by the sternocleidomastoid muscle. But what region of the sternocleidomastoid muscle? Is it going to be the anterior border or the posterior border? Let's follow suit, please, to see how this is interpreted. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This is the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And this is the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. For the posterior triangle, the anterior border of the posterior triangle would then be formed by the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The posterior border of the triangle would then be formed by the anterior border of the trapezius. And this is very understandable considering the position and also the borders of the muscles in question, then the inferior border will be formed by the middle third of the clavicle. The roof of the posterior triangle is formed by the skin, which is the most external limit, and this is followed by a subcutaneous tissue. After the subcutaneous tissue, we have the platissima muscle. The platissima muscle is a special type of muscle that is seen immediately after the subcutaneous tissue. After this, we have the superficial cervical layer. Then we have the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. All these structures form the roof of the posterior triangle. While the floor is formed by the prevertebral layer of the deep cervical fascia and its underlying muscles. This is going to be further explained so that we would see how each of these structures form the roof and also the floor of the posterior triangle. Let's quickly check this out. The cervical compartment of the neck will also be an interest point, and it is good for us to look through it to be able to explain or understand what we have in our previous slide. Cervical fascia, this is fascia around the cervical region, and they are divided into two major classes. We have the superficial fascia. So this is the superficial fascia. Then we have the deep cervical fascia. The deep cervical fascia presents a more interesting presentation. It is further subdivided into three. We have the investing fascia, we have the pretracheal fascia, and we have the prevertebral fascia. The investing fascia means that it encloses the two muscles in the neck which had the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius. This is the T-section of the cervical region of the neck. This is the vertebral bone, and these are the surrounding muscle. Anterior to that region, of course, we know we have a trachea at the front. We can feel that even in surface marking of the anterior midline of the neck, we can feel the trachea. Behind the trachea, of course, we have the esophagus. And lateral to that, we have the carotid sheet. This is the carotid sheet, lateral to it, that encloses the vessels of the neck. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle on the anterior side, and this is the trapezius on the posterior side. What the deep cervical fascia does is basically to compartmentalize the structures within the cervical region. So they try to put them in different compartments. So for the investing fascia, which is a subdivision of the deep cervical fascia, they actually enclose the sternocleidomastoid. They are highlighted in red color. So they enclose the sternocleidomastoid. When they get to the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, 
they unite to form a single fascia and they run a short distance before they open up again to receive the trapezius muscle. When they get to the posterior end of the trapezius, they unite again, run a short distance and open up to receive the trapezius muscle on the other side. They enclose again after the anterior border of the trapezius. They run a short distance. They open again to receive the stenocleidomastoid muscle on the other side. So that is the way they run. Just a single investing fascia, investing the stenocleidomastoid on the anterior part and the trapezius on the posterior part. So you now have a layer around this place, which is the investing fascia of the deep cervical fascia. We have the pretracheal fascia, also highlighted in red. So they run and enclose the trachea and the esophagus and also the adjacent muscles that are located around that region. And this is the pretracheal fascia. Then we have the next one, the prevertebral fascia from the name. They enclose the vertebral column and muscles that are associated with it. So we have the prevertebral fascia. It's highlighted in black. So it encloses the vertebral column and also the muscles that are associated with it. You can see that the deep cervical fascia being divided into three, the investing fascia, the pretracheal fascia, and the prevertebral fascia are all to compartmentalize the structures that are located within the cervical region. And of course, they take the name of the structure that they enclose. Having said that the cervical fascia is broadly divided into two, we have the superficial fascia, which is somewhere up here, the superficial fascia. Then we have the deep fascia, which is now further subdivided into three. So carrying this knowledge to the next slide, it will help us understand the structures that form the roof of the posterior triangle. So the posterior triangle is somewhere around this region because this is the sternocleidomastoid and this is the trapezius. And we know that these two muscles, of course, form the anterior and posterior border respectively of the posterior triangle. So that means the triangle is somewhere around here. So for the roof, we already say we have the skin, which is understandable. That's the most external structure. After the skin, we know it's the subcutaneous tissue, which is tissue that are located below the cutaneous. Cutaneous is skin. So we have the subcutaneous tissue. The next structure that we have will now be the platysmal muscle. We already said that it's platysmal muscle and superficial muscle. There are thin strands that are located deep to the subcutaneous tissue. So you have the platysmal muscle somewhere around here. Then deep to the platysmal muscle, we now have the superficial cervical fascia. After the superficial cervical fascia, the next structure that forms the roof of the posterior triangle will now be the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. We already described this layer before, considering the pattern that it runs, it runs close to the superficial region of the triangle because it encloses the muscles that forms the boundaries of the posterior triangle. Then the flow of the posterior triangle will then be formed by structures around this region. And that will be the prevertebral fascia and of course the underlying muscles. So which group of muscles are involved in the formation of the floor of the posterior triangle? The floor of the posterior triangle will be formed by this group of muscles. So let's take a look at these muscles. The muscles of the posterior triangle from superior to inferior, we have the semispinalis capitis muscle, which is the most superior muscle. Just a very small part of it extends to form the floor of the posterior triangle. Then we have the splenor cervices, the next one, we have the levator scapulae. The next group of muscles are now the scalenius muscle. We have the posterior scalenius, we have the middle scalenius, and we have the anterior scalenius muscle. Well, it is good for us to note that between the anterior scalenius muscle and the middle scalenius muscle, we have a space that is called the scalenius hiatus. Having presented a number of muscles around the floor of the posterior triangle. These muscles are then overlined with the pretracheal fascia because the pretracheal fascia and the underlying muscles are what form the floor of the posterior triangle. So this image 
intersection can be translated to this image in, in longitudinal section. So we have the muscles, then the muscles are now being overlined by the prevertebral fissure. So this kind of presentation is, of course, what we have around this region. We have the same group of muscles that we've presented here, then being overlined with the prevertebral fissure. This is what actually forms the floor of the posterior triangle. Subdivisions of the posterior triangle, the homohyoid from the name homohyoid, from the hyoid bone, then running diagonally down to be inserted on the scapula. So during the part of this homohyoid muscle, it divides the posterior triangle into two. The muscle actually presents two bellies. We have a superior belly and an inferior belly. So it's a slender muscle that is intercepted or divided into two by a middle tendon. So there is a tendon in between that actually separates it into a superior belly and an inferior belly. So below the sternocleidomastoid is where you have this tendon hidden. You need to remove the sternocleidomastoid muscle before you see this tendon. But it is the inferior belly that actually runs to divide the posterior triangle into a bigger upper triangle and a smaller lower triangle. The bigger upper triangle is called the hospital triangle, while the lower smaller triangle is called the supraclavicular triangle, or you call it the subclavian triangle, because within this space is where you have the subclavian artery and the subclavian vein. What are the contents of the posterior triangle? Well, the posterior triangle contains muscle. It contains vessels, which include arteries, veins, and nerves. It also contains lymph nodes. We are going to be taking these structures one after the other to see how they part within the posterior triangle. For the muscular component of the posterior triangle, we have the inferior belly of the omohyoid bone. The inferior belly of the omohyoid bone is one of the muscles that is contained within the posterior triangle. What it does is to divide the posterior triangle into a superior hospital triangle and an inferior supraclavicular or subclavian triangle. So that is how the inferior belly of the omohyoid becomes one of the components of the posterior triangle. Then the next one is the artery. The first artery that we have is the subclavian artery. We already know how our subclavian artery emerge. You can go and check up a lecture on the subclavian artery. They emerge from the arc of aorta and also the brachiocephalic trunk, depending on the region where we are considering. So we have the subclavian, but the region of the subclavian artery that you would see within the posterior triangle is the third part of the subclavian, which is the part that run lateral words from the anterior sclerenius muscle. This is the anterior sclerenius muscle. So you have the subclavian running lateral words from this region. So this is the region of the subclavian artery that you see in the posterior triangle. Specifically, the region of the posterior triangle where you see it is the subclavian triangle. Then the second artery that you see in the posterior triangle are branches of the tyrocervical trunk. And the branches include superficial transverse cervical artery which tend to run upward to supply the muscles of the neck. Then we have the suprascapular artery, which runs downwards. They emerge from the tyrocervical trunk, which is a branch of the subclavian artery. So you see these two arteries within the posterior triangle. The third artery that is seen within the posterior triangle is the occipital artery. The occipital artery is a branch of the external carotid artery. This is the external carotid artery. Remember a lecture on the external carotid artery where we say that the external carotid artery gives off eight branches. And one of the arteries that they give off as they run upward is the occipital artery. So the occipital artery supply the sternocleidomaster and also supply the posterior scalp region. For the specific region of the posterior triangle where you see the occipital artery is around the apex. They just by chance are able to enter through this triangle. So you see them just crossing the posterior triangle around its apex. And this is the occipital artery. Then we also have veins. Veins are also contained within the posterior triangle. And the first vein is the external jugular vein. We know that the external jugular vein is the union of the retromandibular vein and also the posterior auricular vein. They unite and they descend downwards. When they get here, they enter the posterior triangle just around the most inferior part to empty into the subclavian vein. 
So the region that is seen within the posterior triangle is the terminal part of the external jugular vein. The next vein, of course, will now be the subclavian vein. So a part of the subclavian vein will also be seen within the lower part of the posterior triangle. The subclavian vein is located anterior inferiorly to the subclavian artery. So this is the subclavian artery. This is the subclavian vein that receives the external jugular vein. The subclavian vein also forms part of the component of the posterior triangle. And this is the subclavian vein. Then the nerves that are contained within the posterior triangle include the accessory nerve. We know that the accessory nerve has a cranial part that supplies the soft palate and also muscles that control movement of the pharynx and the larynx. So this is the cranial part of the accessory nerve. Then we have the spinal part of the accessory nerve descending downwards. This nerve pierces the sternocleidomastoid then it descends downward within the posterior triangle to be finally terminated onto the trapezius muscle. So they give innervation to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and also the trapezius. And this is the spinal branch of the accessory nerve. So you see that also within the posterior triangle. Then the second is the root the trunk, and also three branches of the brachial plexus. We already know that brachial plexus is formed by the anterior rami from the fifth cervical nerve to the first thoracic nerve. So we have the rami, that's the root where the brachial plexus originate from. We also have the trunk. The trunk, we know that the root unites to form the trunk. We have three trunks. We have the superior trunk, we have the middle trunk, and we have the inferior trunk. So all these three trunks are seen within the posterior triangle. Then we have three branches. The three branches that we have, the first one is the suprascapular nerve. This suprascapular nerve originates on the lateral side of the superior trunk, and it descends downwards to supply the infraspinal source and the supraspinal source muscle. Then we have the nerve to the subclavius. The nerve to the subclavius originates around the anterior part of the superior trunk, and they supply the subclavius muscle. Then we have the dosa scapular nerve, which originates where we have the root of the C5 region. We also have branches from the cervical plexus. We know that the cervical plexus is a plexus that is formed from the anterior rami of this fourth cervical vertebra to the fourth cervical vertebra. And they tend to supply also structures around the neck region. So we have four cutaneous branches from the cervical plexus, and this include the lesser occipital nerve, we have the great auricular that tends to run superiorly upward. Then we have the transverse cutaneous nerve that runs transversely. Then we have the last branch, the supraclavicular nerve that descends downward. Then we also have muscular branches from C3 to C4, and these are the muscular branches highlighted in green to supply muscles around the neck, which include the trapezius and the levator scapula. Hey. We also have lymph nodes. We have the occipital lymph nodes, which is located around this region. We have the posterior cervical lymph nodes, and we have the supraclavicular group of lymph nodes. And these are the applied anatomy. The first one is the pulsation of the subclavian artery in the supraclavicular fossa which is an indentation that is formed by the supraclavicular triangle. You can actually feel the pulsation of the subclavian artery in this region. Then also the accessory nerve, considering the path through which the accessory nerve runs, they are prone to injury, which may lead to the paralysis of the muscles that they innervate. And this include the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius. Then we have cervical or brachial plexus nerve anastasia. We've said that a number of nerves also form the structural component of the posterior triangle. And this includes the branches from the cervical plexus, also branches from the brachial plexus. So within the posterior triangle, these nerves can be located within this space and they can be used to inhibit impulse conduction during surgery. We can check our understanding of this lecture through the following. The first one states that we should describe the boundaries and also the subdivisions of the posterior triangle. This has been well explained during the course of this lecture. And the second one is to list the contents of the posterior triangle. 
Then the third question is to explain the clinical application of the posterior triangle. Thanks for watching. Let's continue to stay tuned to this channel to acquire more knowledge in anatomy.